uh, Kenny and I were just chatting a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause on my screen share for a sec, um, and just to give everybody a heads up, <laughs> strap your seatbelt on because the the materials that I'm gonna be covering are part of uh, something that we've been using in teacher professional learning at the museum for. Oh gosh, uh, uh, maybe eight years, something like that. Um, and it's had many different iterations from four days in person of five hours a day to um, two days and then to COVID times in Zoom world and uh, a three hour version. And tonight we're going to try for like 35 to 45 minutes. So <laughs> it's going to be really quick. Um, and uh, how much? Many of you have probably seen this, the, the Next Generation Science Standards. And it comes as a two volume kind of thing. And the spiral bound thing is all the, the standards pages with the, the PEs and all that kind of stuff. And there's this thing called an appendix, <laughs> which people usually just, you know, chuck. Um, we're gonna be thinking about the nature of science and appendix H is about the nature of science and kind of what science is. And the NGSS is all about learning science by doing science. And then they stick the what science is about way in the back in the appendix and nobody reads that. And so they think, oh, we're doing science. So we're learning science. Well, it, there are certain things about science. Um, uh, who does it, how they do it, why they do it. Um, some of those kinds of things are the nature of science. And a good way to get at some of that stuff is kind of through stories or history of people doing this thing and sort of looking at what they're doing. And that's kind of where this came from. And so I'm going to jump into my slides. <clears throat> and uh, kick us off. Uh, this is a picture from uh, the 77th Street side of our museum uh, last night. Um, it was kind of cool lighting, so I gave it a shot. Um, and that's a really terrible garden there. Well, it depends on your point of view, I suppose. It's all about evolution, right? That's Pecassandra, which is something that people use to just cover the ground where nothing else will grow. So there's some pretty serious competition going on there, I guess. Um, <laughs> and so in our evening, we're going to think a little bit about the NGSS and using a historic case of some people doing science, see stuff and think about what that is. And it's going to be fast. Um, I'll try to give us enough time to chat at the end. Um, this is Darwin's house in Kent, uh, in Down. And it's called Down House. Um, and it's a historic site that you can go and visit. And I highly recommend that. Uh, there's a really great gardener who's been there for about as long as we've been playing around with this stuff. And um, he's a wonderful guy to meet and chat with and uh, very knowledgeable and doing some great stuff there. Um, inside that house, uh, Darwin's son, Leonard, took this picture in 1882. And that thing in the red box is what you might consider a hard drive. <laughs> That's Darwin's vertical file. And it had little cubbies for different topics. And he would write on scraps of paper and he would tear up the scraps of paper and put them in organized uh, fashion according to the topic that the little scrap of paper was about. And the Museum of Natural History has been working with Cambridge for many years to transcribe all those little scraps of paper. Cambridge has most of them. And uh, the Museum of Natural History in New York was getting grant money to pay for conservation of those documents and digitizing those documents. Documents. And then the digital copies were sent to the Museum of Natural History in New York, and some people there were trying to read Darwin's handwriting and, and transcribing them. So this is the archive in Cambridge. And this is David Cohen, who was the director of the manuscripts project at the museum, and he's got a few of the pages. Um, Darwin would tear things up. <laughs> under David's hand there is one of the famous little red notebooks and uh, sometimes a scrap in that book didn't belong in that particular content area he would tear it out and put it in one of his little cubbies and those are some of the loose pages that David's holding there um, 
So these digitized things come to the museum and they've been put up on a website. And so you can visit the manuscripts project and see and zoom in on digital images of the actual manuscript. And to the right, there is a transcription, somebody's um, effort to read what Darwin wrote there. And these are his notebooks, his notes to self. And so they have a certain kind of rough nature to them. <laughs> and we'll get into that in a minute. And he spent about 40 years at Down um, and he had a greenhouse. And this is the kitchen garden and his experimental beds um, to the left there. Uh, Darwin's wife, Emma, gave him uh, a piece of the kitchen garden to do some <laughs> uh, botanical investigations. And he had a greenhouse. It has three sections. And um, he had bees in the back there. And they were on about 12 acres of land. And um, <clears throat> this is a view from the meadow in the back. And that little structure to the left is the greenhouse. And the house itself is straight ahead. Um, and there's all kinds of nature and natural phenomena happening on these 12 acres and in the adjacent countryside. And that was really Darwin's lab. Um, when we do this as a full class uh, evening, uh, um, we <clears throat> had teachers uh, work on a little Padlet. <clears throat> and this Padlet was, you know, what have you heard your kids say about science? What is science? and um, just sort of thinking a little bit about where our, our students are. And, you know, uh, we got all kinds of responses from our participants with that. Um, and that was just to sort of set their mind of, you know, okay, yeah, I've got kids and they have some interesting ideas about what science is. So how do we help them understand sort of the scope of this endeavor? And um, <clears throat> when we do this in person, um, I had teachers go out into their neighborhoods and uh, take a science journal or they're in COVID times, they were taking their cell phones and taking little videos of their block or their backyard and, you know, observing um, the plants and stuff around them. And to help them do that, I kind of put together a little video and I'll, I'll try to provide links for some of this stuff um, this, going to I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but I did a quick little journey outside of the museum. There's and then I went little to my own block in the wall and looked here. at the walls and, and stuff uh, and just used that as an example of, you know, this is how you go out and walk around your neighborhood <laughs> and notice things. There's all kinds of crazy stuff growing in the walls of this, uh, this cemetery, actually, up, uh, yeah, where I live. Of year. And so just for tonight, oh, we'll kind of leave it at that, um, just so that you get a flavor of the sequence. And I had a variety of different techniques I used over the years from a, a printout worksheet that I gave people if they wanted to take notes on that or if they wanted to use like a composition notebook to record observations in, we use that sort of format. And so this is just to get the science learner thinking about plants and where they are, what the context is, and kind of what they look like at first. Um, and then after doing that, we we were gathering noticings about what we were doing in that process. And we created these jam boards. Unfortunately, Google is going to be discontinuing jam boards in a moment. Um, so sad, but there are other tools. And this is just an example from the last time we did this in person <laughs> of the Jamboard. And we kept revisiting this every time we did an activity and they would add post-its uh, about what they did in a particular activity. And at the end, we kind of organized it. And some people organized it around um, the eight science and engineering practices kind of stuff. Um, and other people just sort of came up with their own um, categories. It looks like all these guys are looking at it practices, you know, and, and some of them were just kind of lumped together and they didn't put little headers on them. Um, so this was just kind of the end product of that process. Uh, each time we did an activity, we came back to this, what are the science-y things we were doing? We didn't use the phrase science and engineering practices because that's like a bunch of jargon. We just thought, you know, what did we just do? 
and how is it connected to figuring out the natural world? And so, so that was, uh, every once in a while, we came back to that. And so um, then we started thinking about this story about this guy who was alive, you know, 200 years ago. <laughs> That's a long time ago. And, you know, some of those old fogies around here remember a time before there was an internet or a time, time before there were cell phones. And to transport oneself back 200 years, there was no electricity. There were no lights that you threw a switch on. Microscopes used either the sunlight or a flickering flame. And so observation and tools were very different back then. And sort of what was the context? And one of the pieces of the context was kind of what's going on? What are people talking about? Um, what are some of the tools that they have? Uh, and one of the big people that Darwin was paying attention to was Alexander von Humboldt. And so we, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> okay, right here. We'll go to this one. Um, Humboldt was this German uh, Prussian guy who was traveling around the world and visiting far off places outside of Europe and thinking about them with a scientific lens. And he went on journeys um, to islands, the Canary Islands, to South America. He spent a lot of time there and Central America. And this is one of the images from one of his books. He wrote about these um, expeditions and shared the scientific observations that he was making. And Darwin was reading these things when he was at, at Cambridge, uh, yeah, Cambridge in uh, college. And um, in the course when we were in person, I had poster sized copies of this printed out and teachers were looking at it and trying to figure out what it is. And um, there are, once you start looking at it, if you know anything about plants, you start seeing words like this, cactus. And then over here, laurels. And over here, pines. And uh, basically Humboldt was gathering observations to start noticing patterns. And so he was going up in elevation from the sea level up to the top of an ice covered peak in the tropics and seeing how things changed over with elevation. And he was also looking at weather conditions. So he was measuring barometric pressure and temperature and all these other variables that were the context that these living organisms were surviving in. And so this is a time where people are gathering global observations sailing around and uh, getting around the planet was becoming a little bit easier. <laughs> it's not trivial. Um, and he was on the Canaries. He was also in the Andes climbing up some of the highest peaks in the world back in the early 1800s. That must have been quite an adventure. No Gore-Tex. Um, and so this is kind of what Darwin is reading. And this is what he writes to his sister. My head is spinning around in the tropics. In the morning, I go gaze at the palm trees in the hothouse and come home to read Humboldt. My enthusiasm is so great, I can hardly <laughs> sit still in my chair. This guy is like 22, 23, and he's reading this stuff and going nuts. <laughs> and this is the guy who goes on this voyage. And most of the time, when we see pictures of Darwin, what do we see? We see this Santa Claus. We see this old guy with a white beard. And that's not the guy who was who was being the rebel, you know, and thinking about this stuff. And so he comes back and he spends years and years and years. Oh, my gosh. And finally, in 1859, um, he comes out with this book. And some of you may have read it. This is my copy. This is the origin of species, which he calls an abstract. The rest of this book is Descent of Man, and I can't remember what the other part was, but he, that's the abstract is that thick. 
And that's because he knows there are tons of volumes coming after that. And when he gets back to England, and after he writes that abstract, he writes these things. And they're all about plants. <laughs> and uh, and th there's a few others that he can puts out. You know, he puts out things about plants under or plants and animals under domestication, descent of man, and some other things that are animal related. But a lot of his stuff is about plants, and that is kind of the the stuff that the abstract was about. That was diving into the details. And in his abstract, uh, chapter three is basically his description of natural selection. And so what we did was a thing that I called a, a hypothesis dissection. Um, and I took pieces of that intro to chapter three, and I sort of chunked it by ideas because these really big theories are not one idea that you test. They are many different components. And so, I had people look at these different components and try to summarize them in their own words. You know, what, what, how would you phrase this? Because Darwin writes from the 1800s, and so the language is a little bit different. So we have to try to make sense of these pieces. And then when you have an idea like this in science, you don't test the whole thing. You test pieces of it. And so you test things about the struggle. How do organisms struggle? Do organisms struggle? That's a question, you know? And if your idea is that, yeah, they do, and the struggle is why they change over time. And um, and then there's variation, and then there's inheritance, and there's all these little bits and pieces, and you don't test it all at once. You test a piece of it. And so that's what Darwin was doing in his backyard. He was testing pieces of this big hypothesis. Uh, let me see. Sorry. <laughs> Time. 19. Okay. Um, and so it, it sort of starts with observations, right? So so Humboldt was out there making observations, and Darwin got a chance to go around the world and make some observations and start noticing patterns. And um, so we're going to sort of focus on a collection of plants. <laughs> so when I did this in person, um, I had table sets of plants uh, that had sort of a range of a certain kind of characteristic. Um, and when we did this the first time, we did it at the New York Botanical Garden. We went into the conservatory and I just told people, go look for fuzzy plants. <laughs> and so and so they went into this huge conservatory at uh, the New York Botanical Garden looking for fuzzy plants. And, you know, fuzzy plants, what the heck is this guy talking about? And plants are fuzzy, you know, and cats are fuzzy. People like cats, right? And people, you know, sometimes eh, plants are green, right? Well, you tell people to go look for fuzzy plants and they're going, oh, fuzzy things. I kind of like fuzzy things. You know, I'll go look for fuzzy things. I wonder why some plants are fuzzy. And so they start looking at things and noticing stuff. And that was the first attempt. And then the second time around, we, we had table sets because we didn't have access to a conservatory. And so I had a collection of plants that I got at the florist, you know, the plant shops and stuff around. And some that I dug out of the parking lot because weeds are fuzzy sometimes and sometimes weeds are waxy and sometimes weeds are bumpy or you know in between these things and it's this pattern or this variation that might compose some sort of pattern <laughs> that you want to try to make sense of and so um when we went into the virtual world uh did i do this yeah i like to um I said, well, God, well, I can't ship everybody plants during COVID. So I just sort of had the plants here and I took pictures of them at different scales from, you know, something with a ruler in it to something that involved a microscope. And so I have a whole bunch of different plants. And let me see, I think this is the one I want. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of the plants that I was using. Um, Hoyas, which are really kind of mostly waxy leaves, not too many fuzzy ones. I had a little orchid on bark. Um, things that people were familiar with, geranium, uh, weeds, <laughs> um, nettles. Oh, the nettles were pretty cool. Um, 
And so you can see some of these are in cracks in a wall, um, just weeds growing. And these things are uh, dead nettles and they start as they're, some of them are out there budding right now in uh, New York City. So there's stuff that's there and it's free and it's surviving on its own, which is really cool because it's not planted by a human. It's making its way in the world and it's got to be able to do that. And how? And um, so, so this is sort of exploring plants. And so Darwin did kind of the same thing. Darwin went and visited some relatives and decided to go look for a bog orchid. And while he was looking for a bog orchid, he saw some sundew. And um, he started noticing things about these sundew, these particular plants in the bog. And um, this is part of his notebook. And it says right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but probably um, it says plant. And then it says total leaves. And then it says with flies. <laughs> and this is his data from his first field observation. So what does he do? He goes out, he sees these plants, he got flies stuck on them. Oh, there's a lot of flies stuck on those things, you know? So I'm gonna count them. And he ends up with uh, 56 leaves with a total of 31 flies. Is that right? Am I doing that right? Yeah, yep, 31 flies stuck out of, uh, out of 12 plants. And so this is his first observation and his notes to himself. He eventually, those notes were from, oh gosh, uh, did I put the date on there? Uh, it was like 1860, maybe it was 1860. It was the early 1860s. And the book comes out uh, in 1876. So like 15 years later, after he made the observations and he starts it off, with his field observations. Um, he recounts the data about seeing the flies and, and that was where his question comes from. And so this is practice number one, asking questions. They come from observations of phenomena and this is what he did. And um, so that was using just a little bit of his field notes. That was our first touch into Darwin's notes <laughs> and in a different kind of writing, a book, and there's different language that happens in those two things. And we'll talk more about that time. Oh, come on, what time is it? 24. Um, so, so again, we go back to our jam board and we think about, okay, what did I do with the plants? What did I do? You know, earlier I had written about what I did outdoors, looking at plants. And then I had this collection of plants. I looked at that and what did I do that was sort of sciencey around that? And what is Darwin starting to do uh, around his sciencey stuff? He's in the field, he's noticing stuff, he's counting, he's gathering data, and he's seeing a pattern. Um, and then we spend a little bit of time with some of his field notebooks. This is the first notebook. This has a date on it, 1860. Okay. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> these are his actual notes. So July 17th, between 1 p.m. and 7, put four flies on open flat leaves. And so he, he takes some of these plants back to the house when he's visiting his relatives, and he starts putting stuff on them and, um, and noticing, right, making observations. And so he's coming back to those the next day. And he's adding spiders and he starts adding all kinds of stuff. And we have the actual notes that people can read during the course. This is his field notebook, his science notebook. Um, and so this is his first experiment. And then a later notebook, the experiments continue. This is two years later, 19, 1862. And he starts putting <laughs> twisted hairs. He, he like knots up a little bit of hair and sticks it on there. Um, uh, and he puts starts putting chemicals on there. Sulfur of zinc, dry crystals. Um, <clears throat> and more sulfur of zinc. Strychnine. 
opium, stuff that you have in your kitchen cabinet, in your bathroom cabinet. <laughs> Back in the day, things were a little different. Um, and so this is his actual notes. And it's interesting to read. They're not sentences. They're like, I stuck this on that. And I marked it with a blue ribbon or something, you know? And, and so it's all notes to self. And, you know, sometimes when we're working with students, there are lots of rules about what their science notebook should look like. And science notebooks don't look like those rules. Science notebooks are notes to yourself <laughs> and you can write them however you want, as long as you can make sense of them later. And then when you're communicating your ideas to somebody else, then maybe your writing takes a different format. Um, and so, you know, we talked about styles of writing. Who's the audience? What's the goal of the writing? Um, and, and that can be teased out with some of these documents. Um, and one really cool thing that I like a lot because I'm over here, uh, in New York, um, and New Jersey is just across the river. There was a woman in New Jersey who wrote to a professor at Harvard, who was one of Darwin's friends and Darwin and Asa Gray at Harvard were talking about carnivorous plants and Mary Treat writes to Asa Gray and says, Hey, I like carnivorous plants and I live in New Jersey where we have them. And, um, and I've been noticing these things. And Asa Gray says, you should be talking to Darwin. And so <laughs> Mary Treat um, ends up in a conversation with Darwin. And they we have the letters. Um, let me scroll down. This is what they really look like. Mary Treat's penmanship is very different. And we have her letters. And we have Darwin's letters back. Some of them where oh, I didn't put them in this document, sorry. Um, and so we have a chain of letters and that's a really different kind of communication than in your science notebook. And we have people have a look at these and say, you know, what are they talking about? How are they talking about it? You know, what's Darwin asking her to do? What is she asking him about? Um, and it's two scientists speaking to each other. Mary Treat was self-taught uh, botany person, botanist. Um, and she was writing uh, for science journals um, just yesterday or a couple days ago. I got this in the mail. And this is one of Mary Treat's articles about bladderworts. And this was one of the plants that Darwin was trying to figure out. And actually, Mary Treat figured out the feeding mechanism before Darwin did. And Darwin references her 11 times in his book about carnivorous plants. And so this little thread of conversation that started with the sundew um, continued on and they were collaborators and they recognized each other's work. Um, sorry. Uh, so these historic documents are kind of cool because these are the conversations and later books get published. Um, in the coursework, sometimes this is a story. These are two people. This is one person, you know, getting curious about what he's noticing and another person noticing other things and she's writing about them. And there's a story here. There's people, there's actions, there's um, thoughts, goals, and that kind of stuff sometimes people like to draw and like to represent the story of what's going on and so we used a graphic novel sort of format for exploring that and helping people put into their own words and pictures i guess kind of what they think is important in this story and what's going on um so darwin starts feeding these things and putting different stuff on them and during covid uh we couldn't do that together. So what I did was I recorded a bunch of time-lapse videos and I used a bunch of materials that Darwin himself records notes about using. So ammonium hydroxide, Baker's ammonia is a leavening agent. You can still get it. Oops, I thought that was my Baker's ammonia. It's not, but it comes in a jar like this. Um, and I put the stuff on there and in the Zoom session, if we had more time, we'd do a little vote and we would pick the high ranking ones. Um, for tonight, I think I'll just share a couple of them. Um, let's do the Baker's ammonia since we were talking about it. Come on. Like, 
minutes. So I used my cell phone and I put it on time lapse. Is this playing? Oops, try again. There we go. I mix up a little bit of solution and I just dribbled it on the plant. There it goes. It's kind of right up in this area. This is time lapse. It's accelerated like 10 times, something like that. I think I have it in the title. And then I would come back, you know, I would let it go for, I think, an hour and it would be 60 seconds long. Is that what I did? I think that's the way I did it. And um, so this was an hour's worth of time compressed. And then it would come back the next day and take a still photo of where it was, you know, 24 hours later. Um, and these are Drosera capensis, which is the Cape sundew. Really easy to take care of. Uh, I've got a batch of them here. They flower, they go to seed, you sprinkle the seeds on some dirt <laughs> and you get some more sundew. And so they're they're really easy to care for and a great sort of classroom item. And so I did that one. And um, one of the ones, the wheat gluten one came up because one of the teachers uh, was a vegetarian and ate veggie sausage. And it was like, hey, would it respond to veggie sausage? And so we figured out that the stuff that was in the sausage was wheat gluten. Wheat gluten is protein. And so guess what? <laughs> this is my little lab at home during COVID. <clears throat> DIY it. There we go. It responded to the wheat gluten the fastest of anything I put on there. It's like 80% protein or something, it said on the bag. Uh, <laughs> and this stuff just folded right up on it within, you know, an hour that it had wrapped around this stuff. And usually that would take like 12 hours for other things that I stuck on there. And um, I did use fruit flies, uh, live ones. And then I did some fish food stuff that was insect, dehydrated insect parts. Um, and then Darwin did toenail, Darwin did glass. And he did all those other things that like opium that I don't have in my cabinet. Um, <clears throat> And so we go back. What kind of science things are going on here? There's controlled experiment, you know, different. He's, he's putting different stuff on there and seeing what the dependent variable does. You know, what, how does the plant respond? Um, and uh, so Darwin publishes the book and people said, but you don't have any data about the plant really benefiting. How can you say they're carnivorous? Um, uh, if, you know, you just know that there's dead stuff on there, you don't know what the plant is benefiting or how the plant might be benefiting. And so they tried the experiment and, um, it didn't go well, it failed. <laughs> and when this happens with our students, they have a panic attack, um, and they just think they failed. And, uh, what happens is um, Darwin's son, Francis, does the investigation a second time. And he thinks back on the investigation. Uh, well, hey, this is a really nice article, and I'll try to share the links for these things or to copies of these things. He talks about the book. And, you know, my father put out all these arguments that the plants have got to be benefiting from this stuff. Um, they have all these crazy structures and there's no reason why they would have all these structures unless they were benefiting from them. 
And uh, people didn't like that argument. And he has these whole sections where he has responses of other scientists. So there's this big science discussion, you know, what are you missing? You know, you didn't show this, you didn't show that, you know, I've seen this and it doesn't really tell me much. And, um, and so there's this really cool science conversation. And then he says, well, we did this experiment and it failed. And we used soup plates. We used these things. Darwin's wife was in the Wedgwood family. So they had lots of Wedgwood china kicking around. And so that was his labware. And he filled it up with some sphagnum and put some sundew in there. And it's an acidic solution. And they put a little zinc divider in there. <laughs> and all the plants died. And so Darwin's son in this article writes, I think it was the zinc. The zinc reacted with the acidic water and killed everything. And so I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to use wood instead. And so he does the experiment again. And he gets data. And all the data in here is in these tables. And what we did was we took the um, data. And I think this is it. Yep. I made them into little bar graphs so that they're a little bit easier for people to read. And we asked people the question of this data which do you think is the most important as from a natural selection point of view? So go back and think about that hypothesis. And what is it about this experiment that is being sort of tested? And, and what is really, what, what is it revealing about natural selection? Um, <clears throat> and for most characteristics, the fed plants did better than the not fed plants. He had that little divider and he was feeding some on one side and not feeding the ones on the other side. And in the article, there's a description of the whole setup, how they tried to avoid having some plants get more light and all that kind of stuff and how they tried to avoid insects coming in and sort of screwing up the fed, not fed sort of thing. And graph number six is the seed yield. And that is the biggest difference. And it's like almost three times the seed yield on the fed plants. And if you're talking natural selection, the most important thing is to have offspring with your genes. And so it's it's not so much about how big your leaves are as much as how many seeds are you producing. And so, um, so you know, that that's a crucial thing. And that's what eventually Francis gets to in part two of the article. Um, and we read his piece and his conclusion about that. <clears throat> yeah, there's the conclusion. Um, so it's really kind of a nice little bundle. Um, and it's another kind of writing. It's a science journal kind of writing, and it's a presentation of your findings kind of writing, um, versus a book that's being published and sold you know on the market it's kind of a, a different sort of a thing a little bit um and so we have sort of four different kinds of writing we have science journal notes we have correspondence we have books and we have science journal articles and and so it's an interesting way to think about science and, and writing and communicating which is one of the other science and engineering practices um <clears throat> And we're at 40. Ah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Jay, I, I sent you a message saying that you could take the full hour if you need it. Oh, um, I think I'm just going to share a couple little sort of snapshots of some of the other plants we looked at in the four day version. And that's only going to be about four or five more slides and we'll be done. So uh, when we had the four days, we spent some time up at the New York Botanical Garden and we spent some time at the Museum of Natural History. And we looked at three other investigation kind of things that Darwin did. And one was called the Weed Garden. One was looking at wild cucumber and climbing plants and movement in other plants um, and uh, sort of flower form and function kind of stuff. Um, in particular with the primrose group that's... Um, the primrose and the cowslip primula plants. And uh, with the weed garden, 
Um, I have a couple of teachers who are in the classrooms who also work with me to teach these courses. And one of them set up the weed garden experiment uh, in the courtyard at their school. And basically what Darwin did was he peeled back the, the turf, <laughs> the top layer of stuff. And there's a seed bank kind of thing under there. And he fenced it off. And anytime anything sprouted up out of that patch, he put a wire in there. And he would check on it every day. And he would come back. And if there were more things sprouted, he'd put more wires in. If there was a wire and there was not a plant next to it, he would record that as an organism that lost the struggle to survive. <laughs> it was not going to produce offspring. And so he was tracking how many things were emerging from this patch and how many things were surviving and not surviving and, and that kind of thing. So this is really testing that the, the degree of struggle that there is in the natural world. And there's a lot. It's not about harmony. It's about struggle. And that's a mind shift for many in this period. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so Jan had his little weed garden and he was gathering data. This was a four session course. And so we covered like maybe four weeks um, or maybe more than that. Some of the sessions we had more than a week between them. Um, so it was more like a couple of months. And, um, and so he brought in his data from his courtyard and we used that and also looked at Darwin's data. Another thing that Darwin was interested in, his friend Aza Gray was uh, doing some observations about climbing plants. And one of the plants he looked at was a native wild cucumber that grows around here. It's from North America and um, it's called Echinocystis lobata. Um, it looks like it has little fruits that look like kiwi fruits, kind of only they're green and they're really spiky. Um, they don't really hurt, uh, but they're just sort of a spiky fruit. Um, and it grows wild around here. I've found it in a bunch of the parks in New York City. Um, and I got seeds, ordered them, and it took me a while to figure out that they needed to be in the fridge for like three months before they would germinate. So, you know, we were planning this for a year or two before we actually did it. <laughs> um, and uh, we germinated them. And Darwin was tracking the movements and he came up with this ingenious little method where he used glass and he had it, a piece of glass above and a piece of glass on the side. And so we didn't want to play around with a lot of glass. And so I just took boxes and cut the sides and the tops out. And then we used transparency material and just taped it over those windows. And um, let me see. Oh, it's in that picture. To the right there, or little pieces of glass tube. It's like capillary tube. I just sort of drew it out in a flame to make a little thin piece of glass. And I dipped it into sealing wax to put a little red dot on the end. And um, you put a dot on the box behind the plant. And then you put this little red dot, you attach it to the leaf. And we just did the same thing Darwin did. I took some shellac and I let it really dry out. It's really thick, slowly moves in there. And um, that was basically like a little bit of glue. And I dipped the little end of the glass rod into that. And then we stuck it to the plant. And as the plant moves, the red dot moves and you line it up with the dot that you've made on the back of the box. And then you make a little dot on your transparency. So you end up with something like this on the right, a series of little dots on your transparency. And this is uh, a map or a trace of plant movement that Darwin made for a pea plant, uh, this illustration. And so he was tracking movement. And oops. And the, the whole thing here is that he, he did this with climbing plants. And he's going, oh, this is important. If you got to climb, you got to bump into something that you can climb. And so movement is important. And if evolution is about gradual change, um, you know, maybe other plants move and he did geraniums and all kinds of things that are pretty static looking, but they actually do the same thing, only they do it to a, a lower, smaller degree. And so he was comparing 
the sort of spectrum of movement in plants and seeing that climbing plants move the most because of course they're climbers. They have to bump into something and climb. Um, and so that was one experiment. Another one was thinking about plant form and function. And these are primrose. And if you look on the ones on the left, you see like a little star shaped thing in the center. And those are um, anthers uh, with pollen on them. And the one on the right has uh, a pistol, uh, the female flower part sort of sticking up in the middle. And um, he thought initially that these things were, this plant was separating out its sexes, that some plants were becoming male and some were becoming female because the male or the female parts were sticking out of the top of the flower and the other parts were kind of reduced. Um, and one plant had either one or the other. Uh, and it's kind of a, a really cool thing because in his letters to uh, uh, J.D. Hooker, who was at the Kew Botanic Gardens, there's, there's really great little phrases in the correspondence. And then this one, he says, by Jove, my thinking was wrong. You know, the, the one that I thought was male turned out to produce more seeds than the female ones. And so they're not sort of separating. I have to figure out a different explanation for this thing. And um, one of the important parts of natural selection is to get variation. And if you're self-pollinating, you don't have as much variation coming down the road. What you want is you want your genes to mix with somebody else's genes so that you get more variation. And to do that, plants have evolved structures that are more likely to increase that dispersal of pollen to get their pollen onto somebody else and to get pollen from somebody else. And so this pairing of structures, two different forms, is more likely to get pollen from these anthers way down in this tube onto the deeper pistil in the other flower and the anthers that are high up in this flower are going to be dusting the bee in a spot where the pollen will then hit the pistil of the other flower. And so he was going like, yes, it's about getting variation. Variation is really important. It's part of my hypothesis. And uh, this seems to support the importance of variation as the raw material for natural selection. So. Um, Let's see. I think I'll jump up to this. There's all kinds of great stuff. Darwin draws pictures and they're really bad. Um, so don't be ashamed. Uh, <laughs> this is the weed garden at Downhouse. Um, and this is a really cool thing. This is his sort of periodic, just a where am I today kind of tracking of his activity. And this is from 1858. And on June 14th, he's working on pigeons. And then he writes over here, interrupted. <laughs> and then on July 20th, he began the species book, the abstract. And um, that is when the interruption was the letter from Wallace that described natural selection. And that's when Darwin said, uh-oh, got to start with that book. <laughs> and um, so... So this is kind of a cool document that's in there in the origin. And then the origin comes out, whoops. Origin comes out in 59. What the heck is my cursor? Um, so right here, this red box, origin of species in 59. And then in 60, the weed garden actually happened. Those are kind of his first real experiments to test natural selection, testing pieces of that hypothesis. So the weed garden happens before the origin comes out. And then afterwards, um, David Cohen likes to call this the miraculous summer because this is when he dives into sundews, orchids, and primula. The wild cucumber comes a couple summers later. And then these are all publications that come after the abstract. This stack of books is the full thing. The abstract was the origin of species. And so the red ones are, um, or sorry, the black ones are the, the ones that we kind of looked at in our course. 
um, movement, flower forms, climbing, and uh, carnivorous plants, insectivorous plants. Um, and there were lots of others. I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much, Jay. <laughs> that was fantastic. And uh, before I brief here, as I get ready, that's a good idea. As I get ready to share about ties, I wanted to mention that I've known Jay for a few years, and the way that we know each other is through carnivorous plants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a copy of the magazine over behind me and didn't have time to get to it. <laughs> so thank you so yeah. much, Jay, for that great presentation about uh, incorporating evolution in nature of science, which I'll talk a little bit more about. This was part of our TIES uh, webinar series that we do September through May. TIES stands for the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. My name is Kenny Coogan. I am the Center for Inquiry Education Coordinator. And our three educational programs, one of which is TIES, and then we have two other programs, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. We have a website, TIESEducation.org. There is countless free lessons and labs and bell ringers and activities and websites all about evolution. Therefore, really elementary through high school. We have programs for, let's say there's a pandemic and the students need to do something on their own. We have a lesson for that. We are very active on Facebook. I usually post one thing a day about evolution. It's never negative or political. It's always just like, hey, this is what we learned about today in the world. And then on our YouTube channel, we post all of our past webinars, but we know that teachers are attending, and this might be more interesting for you. If you go to the playlist of this YouTube channel, I have created a playlist of natural selection, human evolution, uh, genes, DNA. So there's it's by theme. So if you're wanting to incorporate something about evolution, but your standard is only to do DNA and genes, we got you covered. If you go to our website or if you go to our Facebook page, you will see that we have about one webinar every month, September through May. But except for February this year, we're pumping it up for Darwin Day. And Bertha, the CFI Education Director, considers Dr. Ken Miller one of the greatest defenders of evolution education in the U.S., he is also the author of many of our biology textbooks. Bertha and I are in Florida, and he is the textbook writer for us. And uh, we hope on this Monday, February 12th, you and your students join us, and you can ask them questions. And that's true, actually, for all of our webinars. We encourage students to attend all of our webinars. All of our resources are free, except for one. And that is our book, because we had to pay for it to be printed. But we have a deal. We have a BOGO deal. Buy one, get one free. This book is written by members of the TIES organization who have tackled the topic of evolution in their classrooms for decades. And it offers sample lesson plans. But if you don't want to buy it, or if you can't afford it, you can still go to our website and you will see there are, uh, there's a whole page about what are the resources that were mentioned in the book. So don't feel like you need to, but some teachers like to have a physical copy. So that is TIES, one of CFI's educational programs. Another uh, branch of our education is called Science Saves. Science Saves is a nonpartisan effort to promote science appreciation by highlighting the many ways science has unleashed human potential, transformed our lives, and given us the tools to overcome all manners of challenges. So we want people to understand that it is okay that our viewpoint and understanding changes, because that is what science is all about. So if you go there, you will see that all of our resources are free. We also have K through 12 resources, 
but for Science Saves, we have lessons for language arts, math, social studies, science. We got them in all those different topics. And uh, one of my favorites is the math one, because if the students have to do a plot graph or a plot, plot chart, why not plot child mortality before and after vaccines? That seems like a fun activity for everyone. All right. Now, if you want to participate in National Science Appreciation Day, we are trying to get a bunch of states to come on board. And uh, the day that we have proposed is March 26, which is the day that uh, Jonas Salk revealed the successful development of his polio vaccine. We have over, I forgot to check, but I think we have between 16 states, I'll say, have come on board, but we have a lot more states that we want to be involved with. And then the last program is called Generation Skeptics. Generation Skeptics program aims to develop and foster an understanding of the world through inquiry-based learning. We provide materials to complement and enhance existing science and educational programs. And if you want to have uh, somebody to talk about all of these things, like ghost hunting and 9-11 conspiracies and vaccines. And uh, if you want to learn about like how to market like a pseudoscience, we have experts that will zoom into your classroom for free. So please consider that. All right. And with that, Jay, that is my commercial. And somewhere in the middle of your presentation, I ran out into my living room to get my first edition 1875 insectivorous book. And then I accidentally won this 1896 edition of insectivorous book. But they both smell great and I enjoyed them. All right. So, Jay, if you oh, want to. I made it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> great stuff. Um, you know, well, I didn't get to the point where we went to the Next Generation Science Standards and their tables uh, that describe the nature of science. And so I just dropped a link in there and um, into the chat. And if you want, you can click on that. And it's the Appendix H. Um, and we use the tables in there to reflect on the sequence of activities that we did with the teachers and how they illustrate certain things about different methods being used to study questions and evidence causing change in thinking. And that was the primula sort of stuff. And um, uh, so lots of connections to help people make sense of the suite of activities. All right, very good. So Jay, I have a couple of comments and questions for you. People are quick to say, implement nature of science throughout the school year. And here at TIES, we like to see people include evolution in all of your units. And this webinar was a great blend of evolution and nature of science. So thank you for that. And uh, not being rigid on note taking is a great piece of advice to give to students because people do like to have the teachers like to really implement those scientific notebooks. Yeah. And uh, this presentation was a great example of how science is collaborative and it leads to discussion. And I agree with that. And I wrote, yeah. a little... go ahead, Jay. Those things come up in the, the nature of science table too, you know, and they're sort of written out in, in GSSEs, <laughs> you know, yeah. so yeah, it is. And, uh, you mentioned Dracera capensis, the Cape sundew. It's a great beginner plant. And yeah. if you go to the Ties Facebook page, you'll see every August, I share the International Carnivorous Plant Society's Carnivores in the Classroom grant. Yeah. That organization donates $150 worth of carnivorous plants to 50 teachers around the world. And I know of at least two people who follow ties who did get it this year. The grant is open August 1st through August 31st every year. And uh, usually there is not enough teachers who apply. So that means like every teacher who applies gets carnivorous plants in the classroom. Yeah. 
two of my teachers got it this year and one got it the last time you sent that around Perfect. in the in my <laughs> inbox. <laughs> And it is international. So if you know international teachers, you can share them that information as well. Angela asks, did Darwin do any observations experiments with co-evolutions, maybe like with insects and flowers? Um, certainly with orchids. He wrote this big orchids book. Um, and that was the first one that came out after the origin, I think. Right? Um, orchids. <laughs> and he was studying a lot of the native orchids to the UK. They have lots of species over there. Um, and uh, that's one of the cool things. Go visit Downhouse in the spring, early summer, and then go to Orcus Bank and check out the orchids in the same area where Darwin was doing it. It's pretty cool. And um, and so he was definitely noticing sort of co Things that were really well matched to each other, you know, <laughs> and the the inference there is that they've been interacting for a long time and uh, are uh, co-evolving. Um, so certainly around the orchids, he was touching on that. Um, and then when you were mentioning Mary Treat, I know she was like a caterpillar and butterfly expert. So I don't know. Yeah. Maybe she told darwin about something <laughs> yeah yeah she's another good one i love mm -hmm. uh, uh home studies in nature is a great little book and you can still get it you know it's crazy on ebay you know people are still like making facsimiles and printing them out <laughs> new <laughs> whenever i talk about carnivorous plants and bladder warts and utricular i always mention that she was first to figure it out before darwin and yeah i don't i don't know if it was a, a, a sasha gray or or somebody else but they thought that the insects were like pushing themselves into the bladder wart for protection they said oh yeah. you just leave them overnight they go in there to sleep and be protected and then <laughs> mary cheats like i think the plant's eating them <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that article um and it is really cool and uh in Carnivorous plants. He really cites her mm -hmm. and, and raves about her. So I, I think it's really cool. And then this one, the title is Plants That Eat Animals. And um, that was the title, I think, of the piece that was in the Tribune, too. So, you know, headline grabbing. Yeah. <laughs> in that uh, English, gar the gar Gardener's Chronicle. Um, I don't know if you have it, but it says it's ungodly to think that a plant would eat an animal. Yeah, that was some of the stuff that was coming up in um, Francis Darwin's kind of intro. All the, you know, what people are saying about the book and about the observations. And some of it was, no, plants do not eat animals. Yeah, wrong, wrong order. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll never prove it otherwise. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's really good reads. Um, Roger Groom says, thank you. I love stories. And uh, thank you for organizing and sharing. Super cool to hear the story and how to engage learners with the story. And I agree. That's great way yeah, to you know, some engage of the, the students. Yeah, some of the CRSE, the um, uh, culturally responsive education stuff that we've been talking about, there's a lot of that's how cultures pass on information through stories because it works. <laughs> you know, you remember people, you remember what they do and how they do it and why they did it and what they, you know, what they were studying, you know, the whole context thing It is really important and stories help. Very good. Okay. You, get, you have lots of thank yous from Emma and Angela. Great presentation. Thank you for all this information and a great session. And then I think because of time, the last question is... Rashid, Mendel was working with his pea experiments in the late 1850s and 1860s. Is there evidence yeah. that they communicated about selection or changes? No, they did not communicate. Darwin never saw Mendel's work. Um, Mendel's work was published, I guess, in a, a little bit 
more of an obscure <laughs> uh, publication, and it wasn't rediscovered until after Darwin's death um, by the science community. Um, and uh, so it would have been pretty cool if they had gotten together. <laughs> that would have been a cool science discourse right there. Um, and Darwin did read in other languages and had stuff translated. And so it I was wasn't just like ask was you if there was limiting a himself. Barrier. Yeah, it wasn't that he was limiting himself to just English sources. You know, he was communicating with people all over the place. And um and also, you know, a fair number of things are translated into English. That was certainly his primary language. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending this live. Thank you, Jay, for a fantastic webinar. I think this is the first one for 2024. And we have, we have a couple more until May. Then we take off during the summer, but then we return in September. And I dropped my email in the chat. And if anybody wants to reach out, that's fine. Feel free. And uh, remember, we encourage you to share these webinars with your students as well. So thank you, Jay, and everyone else. Have a great night.